Hi, this is Steve Dale um, here, and I want to welcome you to our MCLE series for the Golden State Gold Trust. Um, today we have Cheryl Thies, uh, hopefully, uh, here with the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. Now, Cheryl's going to talk a little bit, I'm sure, about DREDF, but DREDF is one of the leading disability rights organizations um, here in the country and was responsible for much of our major disability uh, legislation actually came out of DREDF. Now, it's, it's something that's very personal to me because uh, for about three years, I was actually an intern at the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, uh, which really did shape a lot of my work uh, here. So for those of you that are watching um, here, and um, uh, here is, uh, this is part of our series. Um, this is a good program for both professionals and families uh, here. And what we're going to get is an overview of uh, IDEA and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, really with a focus uh, towards education. So with that, I want to welcome uh, Cheryl. Uh, the other thing that I do want to mention is for those of you that are watching for MCLE credit um, here, what you're going to see, and we'll see a slide that'll come up in just a moment here. What you're going to see is that um, in order to get credit, you need to uh, write down three codes and put them in the uh, MCLE credit form. Uh, if you do not have the MCLE credit form, you can get it by emailing Amy, that's A-M-Y, at G-S-P-T dot org. With that, Cheryl, I want to welcome you here today, and I'm really looking at uh, learning a lot here about um, uh, about IDEA in Section 504. Great, thank you so much. All right, I'm going to start uh, by elaborating just a little bit on what she said about DREDF. Um, we are a national law and policy center dedicated to protecting and advancing civil and human rights. We see disability rights as civil rights, so we come at everything we do from that perspective. Within our agency, we are also funded through the U.S. Department of Education as a uh, Children and Advocacy Parent Training and Information Center. So we serve Alameda, Contra Costa, and San Joaquin counties. Um, we also have some special funding to, to support our most marginalized families, families who are refugees, homeless, children in foster care, and so on. Um, a lot of what we do has to do with creating systemic change. In the parent unit, we're providing support around technical issues, helping families understand their rights and their options when things are not going well or when they're just entering the system and trying to figure out how to put this all together. So let me start by talking about the laws that protect students with disabilities. This is a very broad overview, um, but it's important to, to know the vocabulary and to know the major protections that are available for our students with disabilities. I also want to say, for many of you who aren't in this area of law, it's one of the places where the greatest impact in terms of long-term outcome for youth plays out. So starting from really birth um, all the way until age 22 or graduation from high school, students are protected by many of these laws. And uh, it makes a tremendous difference in terms of how independently they live and what their long-term prospects are in terms of employment, education, and independent living. So I'm going to start with the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, aka FERPA. Uh, I start with this because anytime you're dealing with an issue related to problems or challenges with a student with a disability or a suspected disability at school, it's very important to understand what the school district knows and doesn't know about the student, and also to know what your rights are as a parent or as the young person yourself when things are not going well and statements are being made, claims are being made about behavior, about reasons to put students in more restrictive placements, and it's very important for families or education rights holders to fully understand what the school knows and doesn't know about the student. So FERPA applies to all students, not just students with disabilities. It's covered, it covers any student who's in an educational placement that takes federal dollars. There's three main components. 
Uh, the first is that you always have the right to request student records. So if a family comes to you and they're struggling or having issues about their child's placement or education in any way, one of the first tips you could give them is, have you thought about requesting the student's records? In California, the requirement is that those records be provided within five business days of receipt of a written request. So different states have different rules. Under FERPA itself, the, the federal law, it's 30 days, and every state has its own, um, in California, much more generous uh, protections in terms of access. And that applies in the summer as well, which is something that we find often school districts don't even know. So two reasons to get those records. One, to know everything that the school district knows about the child. And when I say school district, by the way, I'm referring to school, public schools, including charter schools. Uh, to know everything that they know about that student. But in addition, it's not at all uncommon for a family to realize when getting records that information that they had provided the school that they thought was in the record is missing. So it's important to know what the school doesn't know. So for example, students, uh, family may give a comprehensive neuropsych evaluation to the school district that they had done privately or other testing or input that they think is essential for understanding how to support that child at school and then things aren't going well and there seem to be issues around providing necessary support and they get records and realize that somehow when they drop that off in the main office it never actually got into the right hands. So getting the records, understanding what the school knows and doesn't know about the student is very important. In addition, FERPA allows for the correction of records. This can be very important. It's not unusual to have things in a student's file that are, do not belong to that student, unfortunately. It happens. In addition, it's not unusual to have issues come up where there's a question of what the factual basis of a suspension or an expulsion, etc., is. And so the opportunity to say, we want you to investigate, we can test what you're saying about what actually happened here um, is a very important right. And even when the school does its own investigation and comes up with its own uh, determination and as far as whether what the factual basis for something was, you always have the right, um, and families, this can be very reassuring to families, to put the student or the family's version of events into the record permanently anyway. In other words, you uh, are claiming that my student did X, Y, and Z thing. Uh, there was a whole lot of information you left out. My student has a very different perspective, and I want our statement about what happened to follow that student wherever they go. So again, because the records move with students, it allows the other version of events to follow that student as well. So that's a very brief summary of what FERPA is, but it's often the first advocacy strategy we suggest using for when a family contacts us, is let's get all the records, let's understand what's going on here. And before I move on to the next slide, I do want to say that at the end of this presentation, there are a variety of links, and one of them is to all of our sample letters at DREDF, which include pretty much every situation that we've come across. Requesting records is one of them, so it's a good template that families can use and that you can provide a family to help them. Every, and everything else I'm going to talk about today in terms of advocacy, whether you're requesting an independent evaluation um, or an initial evaluation for a child, there are sample letters that cover that scenario. So I just want to remind you, and I'm sure I will come back to that again later. All right, so let's move on to Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. So this is not an education law. This is a civil rights law. It's an anti-discrimination law. And it is essential and applies to all students with a disability that where they have been found to be eligible under Section 504. I'm going to talk about what that eligibility looks like in a minute. But it prohibits discrimination. And so just to give you some perspective on the kinds of things that we see at DREDF, uh, students who are not allowed to go on the three-day outdoor environmental education field trip because they have autism and need a one-on-one -on -one aid uh, are told, you know, so sorry, you're not Ill eligible to go. That's not allowed under Section 504 because that's discriminatory. It's an activity that's being provided to all students. Your student is entitled to, to participate in their disability is not the basis for allowing them to not attend. Um, it also applies to things like after-school programs that are 
run through the school district, again, using federal dollars, because this law is only going to apply in situations where federal dollars are involved. Um, and so all of those kinds of issues, such as access to the after or before school care program, access to uh, school activities in the evening, uh, being told, for example, your child with ADHD, you know, with our medication wears off in the, in the evening, and so therefore, you know, it doesn't make sense for them to be in the school play that everybody else can do. Those are the kinds of things that Section 504 can help prevent. But it's in its most basic form, and the way it's most commonly used, it's to provide a way to remove barriers that get in the way of the student accessing their education in the way that other students without a disability do. So it provides, generally, what you most commonly see are accommodations. Things like, the student can't show what they know unless they have extra time because they have a slow processing speed. This student needs a quiet place to take their breaks um, or to, to take their tests because without that kind of support, they're not able to show what they know in the same way that other students who don't have that disability-related need are able to. So it applies to all individuals with a disability as defined by law. And let's talk a little bit about what that means. First of all, under Section 504, and I, and I will say I have a graphic in a moment to share with you, but students who have an IEP, which means that they're covered under the federal special education law that I'll come back to, those students are also covered by Section 504. But it doesn't make a lot of sense to write two separate plans, so generally when we're talking about 504 supports for a special education student, they've been built into the IEP. So everything I'm about to say can apply to students who only qualify for a 504 plan, but it can also apply to students who have an IEP and are therefore also protected under this anti-discrimination law. So Section 504 essentially says that this, a qualifying student is entitled to a free and appropriate public education and to reasonable accommodation. And 504 isn't limited, as many of you I'm sure know, just to education settings. 504 applies to everyone from birth until death in this country uh, in terms of not allowing disability discrimination if they are a qualifying individual. A 504 plan is what most school districts have settled on as the way to provide adequate support for students because it memorializes what the support and, and accommodations are for that student. The 504 protections were significantly strengthened when the Americans with Disabilities Amendment Act went through just a few years ago. And one of the most important things I always want to make sure that families understand is that mitigating measures are insufficient as a reason to deny eligibility. So that's a lot of words. What do I mean? So just because a student is taking a medication that helps them uh, reduce the, the needs that they have at school doesn't mean they aren't eligible. So most, the most common example might be something like diabetes. If a student is stable and as long as they're having access to their insulin and their blood sugar testing, they look like they're doing fine at school, but without that support, they would be uh, having much more difficulty accessing their education they're still eligible under Section 504. So the fact that a student is doing okay with support through medication or therapy or through uh, ongoing accommodations at school doesn't mean that they aren't an eligible student under Section 504. Um, 504 accommodations are typically provided to level the playing field. And there's two ways to think about this, I think, that help put it in perspective. If a student was a wheelchair user and they came to school on the first day of kindergarten and there was a set of 50 stairs and no ramp, there's no access to education. It doesn't matter whether that student would do just fine once they were in the classroom. They simply cannot come in the door. So that's a physical limitation on their ability to participate. Similarly, if they don't have access to an elevator key where they can go up to the second floor and all of the science and honors classes at the high school are being offered on that second floor, that's discriminatory. They are being prevented access and so providing them with an elevator key is a very simple accommodation. 
in many other ways, maybe a little bit more metaphoric, 504 accommodations can work for students who have other kinds of disabilities. So for example, uh, for a student with ADHD or autism who might not be able to sit and focus for more than 10 or 15 minutes without being having sensory overwhelm or the need for a focus break, providing them with a break is a way of removing a barrier, in this case an attentional barrier for them. So those are the kinds of things that 504 is intended to deal with. Assistive technology can be a very important part of Section 504 support at school. Students who have dyslexia or other kinds of difficulties with reading sorry, um, can often really benefit from voice to text or text to voice, from uh, assistive technology that helps them with writing, students with cerebral palsy or other disabilities impact uh, their ability to write and perform in, with fine motor skills often benefit from these kinds of things. And assistive technology can be a very important way of accommodating a student with a disability at school. I want to emphasize, because there's so much misinformation out there, and you are very likely as an attorney when talking to a family, in whatever way you support them, when a family comes to you and says, and by the way, things aren't going well at school, and you do a few uh, follow-up questions and little issue spotting, to, to note here that one of the most common compliance issues we see with 504 is that there's a little bit of folklore out there in the school districts that unless a student has a medical diagnosis, they wouldn't be eligible for support under Section 504. That's simply not true. Under Section 504, the school needs to make an individualized determination as to whether the student is eligible based on records, interviews, uh, assessments if they feel that that's necessary, considering outside reports that the family provides, but there is no requirement that the family come in with a medical diagnosis, hand it over, and then, then the district just, or again, district or school just writes a 504 plan. The idea is that the school is making an evaluation and a determination based on quality data and evidence as to whether this student has a disability that meets the criteria under Section 504, and because of that disability, needs to have some barriers removed, needs to have access, and is entitled to a free, appropriate public education. I'm going to go a little bit more into uh, definitions around what free, appropriate public education means. It has a slightly different definition under Section 504 than it does under the IDEA, the Special Education Law. But for the purposes of this program, I would just say that the objective is to ensure that there's no cost to parents or to families or to students for support and accommodation that can include special education. Um, that's another myth that's out there, that students who have 504 plans don't get special education service. That's simply not true. If getting occupational therapy or speech and language therapy or access to a school's resource classroom is needed to remove barriers for that student and provide them with that free appropriate public education, then they absolutely can access them. And there are there's actual guidance from the uh, U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights to schools on this very issue. So Section 504, in a nutshell, is a way to make sure that all students with disabilities have barriers that get in their way uh, removed so that they can participate and benefit from their education in the way that their typically developing peers can. I'd just like to show this graphic to people so that you understand what I said early for the, earlier for those of you who are more visual learners like me. Um, so if you think about this graphic as all students in a classroom or all students in a school, um, they're protected by many different laws that relate to education. Some of those students will have a disability that upon an evaluation determination by the school results in them being found to be 504 eligible students and for them a 504 plan will be written. Some of them will be in this next group of students that I'm going to focus on and that is the students who in addition to needing barriers removed and access equal access to education also need specialized academic instruction, and those are students who are eligible for an IEP. 
So just to take a look at the graphic and understand that students with an IEP are doubly covered by 504. All right, so let's talk now a little bit about the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It's the primary protection, legal protection, that is focused solely on education. As I said a moment ago, Section 504 is not an education law. It can apply in a workplace. It applies in community activities that are federally funded. Uh, it applies in a variety of settings. The IDEA is an education law, and it's, again, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It was most recently uh, reauthorized in 2004, um, and it is the primary way in this country that we individualize the education for our students with disabilities that are not only providing, or sorry, creating barriers for them at school, but for whom individualizing the educational program is essential so that they can benefit from it. So it's a federal education law. It started in 1975. Uh, there are 13 broad categories of disability. I want to point out that these are not medical diagnoses, right? So we do not give a student an IEP because a medical doctor diagnosed them with autism or diagnosed them with a mental health disability or diagnosed them with an intellectual disability. We give students an IEP because the school district or charter school made an eligibility determination where they found that the challenges that they were having were related to a disability that fits into one of 13 very broad umbrella categories. So I'll talk a little bit about what those look like in a minute. And so students have to fit into one of those 13 categories. That's sort of the first prong of a two-prong test. And then they need to, by virtue of that disability, need specialized support and instruction in order to benefit from their education. The evaluations that a school does are what drive their eligibility determination. So a frustration point for a lot of families that you may encounter is, wait a minute, we went to the preeminent expert on autism at Stanford and they told us that our child has autism and we brought that 40-page neuropsych evaluation to the school and said, give us an IEP, and the school said, sorry, we have to do our own evaluation. That is correct. The school has to do their own eligibility determination. And the reason is, and this is a place that is very confusing for many families, is that they're not making a medical determination as to a diagnosis. They're making an educational determination as to whether the student is eligible under this federal education law. Um, students who are found eligible get an IEP, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means, but the most important thing to remember is that an IEP individualizes the educational program for that student based on their unique needs and also on their strengths. And that's something that we find is often left out of the equation. I think it's really important to back up a minute here and think about what the purpose of this law was. Because what we find is that one of the frustrations for families is that they feel that uh, it's, it's a law that says, okay, your student can come to school and from year to year, you know, we'll sort of let them in, we'll support them, but that often the big picture is lost. And so families will say to, to me when I'm talking to them, you know, the teacher's only going to have Johnny for a year, they're only going to have Maria for a year, at the end of the year they're done, but I sit at the end of Maria's bed at night and I wonder what her future is going to look like. Will she ever live independently? How much support will she need from us? Um, she's five years old now. She has an intellectual disability. What's that going to look like 20 years from now? And so parents have the long view. And in that respect, there's just a, a fundamental difference of perspective. But the law was written with that end game in sight. And I think it's important. I often have families include this language in letters they write to the school district. So what the Congress said was that Disability is a natural part of the human experience. Let's face it, if any of us are lucky enough to live long enough, we're likely to at some point acquire a disability. That disability in no way diminishes the right of individuals to participate in or contribute to society. So this is pretty, especially in 1975, pretty radical stuff uh, that we have, people with disabilities have things that they bring to the table 
to, and that they need an opportunity to contribute to their community and their society and to benefit from it as well. Moreover, that the improving educational results for children with disabilities is an essential element of our national policy. So that's not a small thing. We're not just trying to get through from year to year. We're trying to improve educational results. We know that employment options for people with disabilities are very limited. We know that uh, college completion for students with disabilities is significantly below their peers. High school graduation rates are lower. There are significant uh, challenges for, that students with disabilities face that can have a long-term impact on their quality of life 20 years, 30 years, 40 years down the road. We also uh, need to remember that the IEP was, is supposed to be designed to meet the student's unique needs and, and this is what's really important, prepare that student for future education, employment, and independent living. So when a parent calls me and says my student has multiple significant developmental disabilities and I feel like they're in a, uh, an education setting like a special day class where it's like daycare, they come in and they get their basic needs met but they're not really learning, is that okay? I point them to this big picture under the IDEA that the purpose is to prepare the student for future education, employment, and independent living. And those should always be the goals. No matter where a student is today, the purpose of an IEP is to help that student move forward in these three areas. So to get down into the, the guts a little bit of the IDEA, there are six core principles. And I'm not going to go through all of them uh, in, this, in this setting because we don't have that kind of time. But I want you to at least know what these basic elements of the foundation on which this law is built include. The first is that we find students eligible by evaluating them and we use appropriate evaluations and assessments. So when a student is referred to special education, and I'll talk in a minute about how that happens, the idea is not to just look very narrowly at, you know, okay, is there this one thing going on? It's really to consider all of the students' strengths, all of their challenges, what's getting in the way of them benefiting from their education, and coming up with evaluation data that's going to drive everything else that we do when we develop an individualized education plan, an IEP for that student. So if things go wrong at this point, it's very problematic because you cannot build a plan without an appropriate foundation. And this is where we figure out what are the needs of the student. The second building block of the IDEA is this right to a free and appropriate public education. So when I'm sitting in an IEP meeting, we don't usually go or have the time to go to IEP meetings for families, but we sometimes do for students who are in foster care, or families that are homeless or very vulnerable. Uh, it's not unusual to hear the school say, well, no, we agree that she could benefit from some tutoring. You know, uh, Linda Mood Bell right down the street, they have a great program. You might want to sign up for that. And, you know, to me, the appropriate response from the parent in that situation would be to say, well, okay, where would I send that bill? Because if you're recommending that that's needed to provide learning access to the student, then, and since my child's entitled to a free, appropriate public education, that cost shouldn't be coming out of my pocket. Um, appropriate is a funny word. Uh, appropriate, there's lots of uh, due process hearings around what, what is, in fact, appropriate. What's important to understand about that is that it's not, there's no guarantee to an outstanding uh, top of the line public education, but there is a right to an appropriate education based on the student's unique needs that gives them meaningful educational benefit. And I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. It was the uh, whole focus of a recent Supreme Court case, the Andrew F. case, and the idea is, do we essentially just have to provide some minimum floor of educational opportunity. I mean, what is the standard here? What are we going for? The way I explain it to parents is in a more user-friendly way. I say if you think about education as being going from San Francisco to New York City and getting to New York City as your kind of graduation or leaving the, leaving the school uh, ex exit point, then the district's or school's obligation is to provide a good working vehicle, doesn't have to be a BMW or a Mercedes-Benz, but an adequate vehicle, doesn't break down constantly all along the way, doesn't take the student by way of uh, Guatemala, um, you know, has a relatively straightforward, direct route with a clear goal, and uh, 
doesn't create all kinds of problems for that student moving forward. Public education, I just want to emphasize again and again and again, charter schools are public schools. So a lot of our families come to us and they will say, we were at a charter school, my student has a developmental disability such as autism, or they did an evaluation and found that she has an intellectual disability, and they said to me, well, we're really not set up to support students like yours as a charter school, maybe you want to go back to your regular school district. So when charter schools uh, get chartered, they have to explain how they're going to meet their requirements under the federal special education law, the IDEA, <coughs> excuse me, and um, they don't have a pass for that. They are still on the hook, even if they themselves go back and negotiate with the local public school because they don't have a program that would work for the student they're not off the hook in terms of doing that negotiation. They have an obligation to identify children, to individualize their education, to provide appropriate supports, and there is no special out that says, sorry, it's too hard for us to do that as a charter school, go back to your public school. The IEP we're going to spend more time talking about, number three, um, is essentially the document that we use to plan for and memorialize what we're going to do to support this student from year to year in special education. Least restrictive environment is where a lot of tension comes up for student serving students. The law is clear. Students need to be in their least restrictive educational environment. That means a place where they would go to school if they didn't have a disability, unless it's in their best interest to be somewhere else. So we tell families, when you go to your initial IEP meeting and the district comes in and they say, you know, we did the evaluation and we agree that um, Jose is eligible and therefore we are going to place him because he has autism in our autism classroom. That should raise immediate red flags for you because that's not an individualized determination. One child with autism is not the same as another child with autism. There's a huge range of challenges and abilities that children bring to the table and that determination about what an appropriate placement is for them has to be made on the basis of their individual profile. Um, parents and students as appropriate, meaning at least at 18, unless they're conserved, um, but starting no later than 16, they're supposed to be involved and included in this process. And very often we, we see them coming to IEP meetings much sooner, have important participation rights under this law. It's one of the big places, again, where there are due process concerns is, you know, did the district make a unilateral decision about what the student needed without taking into account the parents' input, perspective, allowing them to participate in the process. This is also the place where many of our families are significantly disadvantaged because of language barriers uh, or because of education barriers. We have an awful lot of families out there who have very poor literacy skills themselves. They're reading these documents that are often highly formalized and uh, use specialized language, and if nobody explains what their parent rights are to them in a way that they can understand or using their language, uh, then they are not able to participate in the way that the law requires, and so there's lots of barriers that come up here. Finally, there are procedural safeguards built into this law, and those include everything from a right to just challenge the school district's evaluations, right starting at that very basic level of is this student eligible and what are their needs, all the way through to res trying to uh, resolve disagreements locally with the school and the school district or charter school, um, all the way up to making complaints to the State Department of Education, asking for mediation, and ultimately the right to go to a due process hearing over something where there's a fundamental disagreement. And I'm going to come back to some of those things because those are the kinds of options as attorneys you want to know that your families have available to them. So, in terms of the cycle of special education, I'm going to zip through this because it's written down for you. You can refer it. There's lots of material out there that will explain what these timelines are. But there are some key stumbling areas, and I just want to make sure that if families come to you with concerns about this, that you have a broad overview of how this works. So, special education eligibility starts with a reason for concern, whether it's the student has Down syndrome and has been diagnosed and um, is exiting regional center services and entering the public school at age three to a middle schooler who's suddenly, you know, displaying a lot of difficulties and having a lot of problems. 
and you know may need special education support. Whatever the reason for concern is, and it may be a diagnosis, which is what that DX means, but it's not required, an evaluation needs to be done after there's a request for assessment. So one of the places where families constantly struggle, I would say not a week goes by at DREDF, and I imagine this is true for every parent center in the country, not a week goes by where we don't have a family tell us that they were told that if they wanted an evaluation to see if their child was eligible, what they needed to do was go to an, a student study team meeting called an SST or some other kind of informal school meeting and the school would consider it or think about it or maybe they want to try some other interventions before they even answer the, student, the parent's request for evaluation. It's such a problem, again, that the U.S. Department of Ed Special Education Office uh, came out with guidance uh, several years ago in which they said, you know, you cannot delay if a parent requests an evaluation for special education, you cannot delay that request while you have all these meetings. You can certainly invite the parent to participate in these meetings. You can certainly try other things, but you can't stop the timelines that I'm about to go through very quickly. So if you encounter a family where they said, well, we took your advice and asked for an evaluation, but they said, oh, well, we haven't tried these other three things first and we're gonna, we'll come back to this next year if they haven't worked, understand that that's a violation of these legal timelines and of the IDEA. Once a request for assessment in writing comes into the school, and if the family asks for it verbally, the school district actually has a legal obligation to assist that parent in putting that request in writing, then a, the clock starts ticking. A teacher can make a special education evaluation referral request without having to wait for any of these meetings. So whoever makes that request for an evaluation or an assessment in writing starts a 15-day timeline. These are calendar days by which the district or charter has to respond. So within 15 days of the receipt of a written request, there has to be a formal notice of, yes, we will move forward and we'll evaluate your child and see if they're eligible or no, we're not going to, and here's why, and here's our legal basis for why we don't. We tell families, and you are more than welcome to share this information with them as well, that if they're told no, the first thing they might want to consider doing is calling their local parent training and information center. And I should have said at the beginning that there's one of them in every state and territory in the United States. Um, and the services we provide are free. And we can often help turn that situation around. They'll say, well, the student's passing all their classes, and so they don't need a special ed evaluation. That's not it's not legally required for a student to be utterly failing in order to get an IEP. Um, sometimes it's your student is too new to us, we need some time to get to know them, and so on. But if a parent hits a barrier here in this very early start part of the process where the district says, no, we're not going to evaluate, they probably want to explore what their options are with their parent training and information center or a special ed attorney at that point. Um, the district, if they agree to assess, provides an assessment plan within 15 calendar days. It says what they're going to do, what kinds of evaluations they're going to do. The parent gives informed consent, and once that parent gives informed consent to those assessments, a legal timeline starts up. That includes 60 calendar days, not including any break of more than five. So it's a little bit technical, so let me say it again. Any vacation or break in instruction that lasts more than five days, five calendar days, stops the timeline. So usually summer, usually the holiday break in December, uh, if it's more than five days, will stop the timeline. Otherwise, it's ticking, 60 days. So the district has 60 days to do all their evaluations, gather all the material they need to make an appropriate eligibility determination, and come back to the table with the parent to discuss whether or not the student's eligible. If they find the student ineligible, there's things the family can do at that point. If they find the student is eligible, they develop the IEP generally at that meeting. Sometimes a part two meeting is required. And they develop a plan. I'm going to talk about the components of those plans in a minute. Um, and then once that plan is agreed to by everybody and the parent signs this IEP, which is a, a lot like a contract, uh, that defines what the district or charter school is going to do to support this student, then at least every year the team meets to review the student's progress, and every three years they do the whole thing all over again by reevaluating the student. 
So let me stop here and say that if you are doing this for credit, that the code that you would want to enter here is 4920. So I just want to point it out before I move into some of the more nitty gritty details about IEPs. Okay, so I've given you this broad information and relatively quickly about this very complicated law. Let me go over some of the essential things that you need to know that because families encounter these difficulties regularly. Again, it's not because you need to know every detail. In fact, if you walk away from with anything from this presentation, I hope it will be that there are free resources for families, including organizations like ours in every state. They're called Parent Training and Information Centers, where you can refer families. But it's also true that for example, if you're helping a family with a special needs trust and the family's telling you that part of the reason that they, we think that this child isn't going to be able to manage their money is that the school district isn't teaching them anything about basic math, even though they could learn it, then we want you to be able to tell that parent, you know, you could address that through the IEP. There's ways to deal with that kind of a problem. Uh, let me refer you. Let me give you some documentation about you know, what you could do in that respect. So basic IEP requirements. IEP meetings answer big questions. Um, the big question are, questions are, where is this student right now? Where, what are their present levels of performance? In other words, what are their needs? What are their strengths? Um, let's identify all the support they're going to need in order to benefit from their education. Knowing that, where do we want them to be in a year? Let's write goals and objectives for that student so that we know Right now, the student is reading at a, a grade level of kindergarten and they're in third grade. And that a year from now, we want to work on closing that gap and have them maybe reading, you know, end of first or even beginning of second grade because we're going to provide some specialized instruction. Or right now, the student's behaviors are resulting in them being out of instruction frequently throughout the day. We want to write an IEP that helps address those behavior issues by teaching the student other ways of dealing with their frustration or their challenges so that a year from now maybe they aren't out of instruction 50 percent of the time maybe they only need to come out of the classroom 10 percent of the time so the purpose again is this immediate cause and effect where are we now where do we want to be in a year and it's not just minimal uh, it's really sh progress and growth for that student then we ask how are we going to help the student get there if we use the example of the student with behavior issues, uh, it's not going to be a miraculous thing where a year from now the student just grows out of their difficulties, right? We, we want that student to receive actual instruction and support, possibly the help of a paraeducator or a behaviorist or somebody so that they can grow because they're being provided with specialized support and instruction. We also want to know how are we going to measure whether the student met these goals? It's really frustrating for many families to go to IEP meetings where they're told, oh, your student's doing great, she's such a sweetheart, um, without any actual evidence about their academic levels. You know, a year ago they were doing math at this grade level, today that we did an assessment, and here's some work samples, here's some evidence to show the growth, but just to say, oh yes, they're meeting their goals without any kind of backup to show that they are, or documentation. Um, we want to make sure that IEPs are written in a way that if that parent, and this is how I explain it to families, picked up and moved to New York City from Berkeley tomorrow, uh, New York City schools would know exactly what support they're going to need the day they come in and enroll. It's very clear um, and it's all spelled out. So we often see pushback from schools who say, just trust us. You know, we know what to do, we're the experts, and we'll provide the student with support, and we push back and say, that doesn't really work because an IEP needs to follow the student wherever they go, and we need to spell out exactly what services and supports they're getting, monitor whether they're getting, getting them, there should be a way to show that they receive the speech and language therapy, or physical therapy, or mental health support that the IEP said they were going to get, that documents it and shows the growth of that student. So making sure that we know where they are, we know where they want them to go, we know what we're going to do to support them in getting there, and we're going to, we have a plan for how we're going to measure that. So those are big questions that IEP meetings are intended to answer. 
Um, another common problem that parents are likely to come to you all with are concerns about placement. So I went to the IEP meeting, they said my student was eligible or continues to be eligible for an IEP, but they said they can't support them in the local school anymore, that they think now that he's in middle school, inclusion really isn't the right thing anymore and we should just move him to a special day class or to a non-public school that specializes in supporting students with his kinds of needs. So placement under the IDEA, under this federal special education law, is not a physical place. And it's helpful to explain that to parents. Placement means where and how are we going to provide the services and supports to the student that's the least restrictive environment for that to happen in. So if everything in an IEP meeting is focused on moving the student to a situation where they're farther away from typical peers and have less exposure to them, that should be a determination that's made based on the needs of the student, not because they're hard to serve, not because the inclusion program is over-enrolled or there aren't enough aides, not because the aide quit, so now the school says, well, we don't have an aide, so we should move them to a special day class, uh, which is a, a classroom where all the students have a certain level of disability, and um, it, it, can, it can be a, an import, uh, important support for some students, but it can also be very restrictive. It's important to say to families, look, the research and the evidence over the last 30 years are actually pretty overwhelming. The more students have exposure to typical peers, the better they're going to do. There are no special day classes in the real world. There are no institutions who are sending students to because we don't want to do that anymore. We know that's not in the best interests of our young people with disabilities. And so even if they need to be in a more segregated setting for a period of time to get more support, the plan should always be to get them back to their least restrictive placement. So when you're hearing concerns about placement, and I, you know, I, I feel compelled to say, you know, just recently here in California, we had a young student with autism die after being in a non-public school and subjected to very inappropriate prone restraint, meaning on the floor, for a significant period of time, that a lot of the things that happen to students with disabilities that aren't good um, and that are dangerous often happen away from more public school sites. And so we want families to always think about what's the least restrictive environment in which to provide the services and support. The IEP needs to spell this out. So this isn't a determination where they say, you know, don't worry, we'll put Kathy in the gen ed classroom whenever she's having a good day. We'll let her go do art with the gen ed kids. That's not the way this works. The IEP defines legally a percentage of time that that student can be pulled out of gen ed for the purposes of receiving their specialized education and the rest of the time the expectation is that they're in the general education classroom. So that should be something a parent could find in the document. You could help them go through the IEP and look for the place that says percentage of time in general education, percentage of time out, and it's a number. It's a doc in the document itself. I also just want to point out that school, schools, and again, this includes charter schools, are responsible for having available to them a continuum of placements. Students move around a lot. We have students who sometimes have such significant needs that they need to be in residential treatment for a period of time until we can stabilize them. That's not a long-term placement. So the continuum is a, a program starting with, in general education, maybe with some support just pushed into that gen ed classroom, maybe an aide, maybe some special education co-teaching goes into it, some accommodations, all the way to coming out a little bit every day for some specialized help in maybe math or reading or behavior, speech and language, um, moving to a special day class where they're in a, uh, a program where they are with all students with disabilities for the majority of their day, but maybe have some opportunity to go out for the non-academic portions uh, to general education, to programs that are not affiliated with the public schools, that are non-public schools, but day programs, to home and hospital instruction in some situations, and to residential treatment in some situations. So there has to be a continuum of placements, again, because students frequently, their needs are changing and evolving over time, and if an IEP is working, then a student in a more restrictive placement 
should be being assisted to come back into a less restrictive placement over time. All right, so these are some of the big issues that come up with IEPs. Another big one I wanted to be sure to at least mention here is that the transition to adulthood is a major area of focus of the IDEA, the, the Individuals with Disabilities Act. So starting no later than age 16, and in some states it's younger than that, uh, the districts are responsible for developing a transition plan for students. And that means we're thinking about now, soon this student will be exiting either with a high school diploma or they'll turn 22 and no longer be eligible for school district services because they didn't get a diploma, eligibility stops at age 22. What's the plan for helping them transition into adulthood? And there are a lot of compliance issues around these transition requirements. So I wanted to include just a little bit about that. I'm going to briefly go over it. First of all, transition planning is not a special process. It's part of the IEP planning process. It talks about what the student's um, transition requirements and goals are in three areas in terms of employment. You know, what, do you, what kind of work do you want to do? Uh, in terms of education, you know, do you want to go to an internship? Do you want to go to job training? Do you want to go to college? What kind of college? And in terms of functional and independent living skills. So for some students, maybe a student with a very significant level of disability, maybe we're not talking about further education and employment. Maybe we're focusing most of our transition planning on helping them with some of their basic functional living skills that they will need in order to be as live as independently as possible um, once they age out of the school system. For other students, we might have goals in all three areas. Uh, my son with autism needed to go to college and wanted to go to college, I needed to have employment goals to think about his long-term career goals of being a software engineer, and then needed to know how do you ask for help when you need it? How do, what do you do when you're sick? How do you manage your finances? And so on. So those are all functional living skills. So for some students, they need help in all these areas. The transition plan should spell that out. If you're dealing with a family who comes to you and they're looking for your support in terms of long-term needs of their student with a disability, and they're still in public school, ask them if there's been a meeting to discuss the transition to adulthood and what kind of support or individualization is going to be provided to their student to help them be success as successful as possible in their transition to adulthood. One of the big places we see problems is that students often aren't even taught what their disability is. They can't tell you how it impacts them. They can't ask for help. They can't tell you what their strengths are or what the disability brings to them in terms of strengths. And in terms of self-advocacy, this is essential. So we don't want to leave this out of the discussion. Um, at 18, under the IDEA, a student holds their own education rights. Um, I shouldn't say at 18, depends on the state, but in California it's 18, if it, whatever the age of majority is in that state. So at that point, the student is the decision maker unless the family already has a plan in place to conserve that student or permission from the student to continue to act in their interests in terms of uh, being their educational advocate. Uh, that's something that you're welcome to contact us about in terms of getting forms and so on around how to, how to do that. We always want students to be able to make their own decisions to the greatest extent possible. And there are a lot of great new programs and services available around that, um, including supported decision making and person-centered planning so that a student doesn't have to be conserved and lose all of their rights, but where the support that they do need is spelled out for them. And so this is a conversation to be having with the school district early on, probably no later than age 16. All right, I'm going to skip over some of the transition requirements, just to, but I wanted to include the slides for you so that you can see what's supposed to be in a plan like this. Um, I want to just stop here too and say there are a lot of questions and concerns that come to us around whether or not families should sign these IEP and 504 documents. So just for a moment, uh, it's important to help your clients understand they never have to sign at a meeting. If they don't understand it or they don't agree with it, they shouldn't sign. They can sign that they attended the meeting, but that's all they have to do. Um, and that they can sign with exception. So. One of the sample letters I've included uh, in, the, in the resources 
uh, is the sample letter to sign an IEP or a 504 plan with exception. I agree to this, to this IEP, except that I don't think my child should be in this non-public school placement. Everything else, I want you to do that, the speech and language therapy, the special ed instruction, um, maybe the need for a, an aid for part of their day, but I'm not agreeing to moving them to this other placement. So it is possible for them to sign with what they agree to and not sign for what they don't agree to. So we're really hoping that those letters are something you can share with your clients. You know, it's not all or nothing. Don't refuse to sign anything if you're therefore not signing that your student's eligible for support. We want the student to be eligible, um, but if you disagree as to what the eligibility should be, for example, families often feel that their student's being designated intellectually disabled, and they're like, no, I think there's something more going on. Um, there are important ways they can challenge that, but they can certainly say, but I do agree my student's eligible. Our difference of opinion is just around the eligibility category. All right, so I'm going to stop here and just say that the code for this section of the program, code number two, is 0258. If you wish to receive credits, you're going to make sure that you uh, document that code at this point in the program. All right, so in this last half hour, I want to talk a little bit about the kinds of issues that come up and just help you understand the very broad landscape in terms of legal uh, and advocacy actions that can be taken when problems arise. The first, and I don't need to tell this to attorneys, is that documentation is the name of the game. And families often don't understand this. What they will tell us is, well, I don't want to seem adversarial or difficult with the school, so I just had a phone conversation. And what I say is, that's fine, have a phone conversation, and then get off the phone, write an email, and say, thank you, Mrs. Smith, for talking to me about my child, Johnny. Uh, what you said was this, and what I said was that, and I think we reached an agreement to do X, Y, Z moving forward. And hey, if I got any of this wrong, will you make sure you correct me? Thanks so much, because now you've documented it. And this doesn't come very naturally for a lot of families. There's a lot of cultural differences in terms of, you know, you're never supposed to, to question the educator and so on. And so learning to be respectful and to say things like, I respectfully disagree, or I'm sorry, help me understand why you think that would be appropriate. Those are the kinds of things that families need to learn to do. Um, making their requests in writing. So the students w being suspended for something that they did that was an inappropriate behavior, the parents been meeting with the teacher or even the school team for weeks or months or sometimes even years um, and saying, do you think we should evaluate our, my child to see if he needs an IEP? And they've said, oh, you know, no, he doesn't need that. Um, and no one has ever said, put your request in writing and we'll answer you in writing. So those are the kinds of things that go wrong because now the parent has no documentation or evidence to show that they've actually been trying to raise this issue for their child over time. So making sure that things are documented is really important. Making sure that, that you know and families know what the timelines are. So for example, as I said, you don't have to learn them from this presentation. They're easy to look up. But if a family asks for an evaluation to see if a student's eligible, they want to write on their calendar 15 calendar days from then that they should be getting an answer. Um, it's not at all unusual to see them wait months because someone lost the request, went to the school secretary, they didn't send it to special ed, and unless the parent has proof of delivery that they brought that request for evaluation into the school office, they've got nothing. And so we really want to emphasize and we hope that you will emphasize to families the need to document what they're doing. So many of the problems we see down the road could be avoided if we had appropriate documentation. Uh, I also want to say that if conflict arises, you know, there's some level of disagreement, there's some issue that's coming up, taking that very first step that I started this presentation with, which is getting all the records, is helpful because any special education or education attorney who's going to support a family is going to need that right from the get-go. So you, it's a really helpful step if the family does it. It's free. They, the way the law works is the school district can absolutely say, we'd like to charge you a certain uh, cost per document if you want us to photocopy these things. We'll make it available to you, but if you want to photocopy it, we can bill you. 
Um, but it is also important to know that if the family says in writing to the school, I'm really sorry, but I cannot afford to pay for copies, that the school district must provide them at no cost. So that can't be a barrier to getting these records. Um, if you get the records, the other thing you want to do is make sure that all of the goals and objectives in an IEP are SMART. What do I mean by SMART? And it's an acronym that gets thrown around. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here, but just a specific, measurable, appropriate, reasonable, time-limited goal. Um, so goals are often written something like this. Currently, Marta is reading around kindergarten level. A year from now, we want Marta to be reading first grade level. There's very little way to know exactly where Marta is and to measure, is she kindergarten first month? Is she kindergarten ninth month? Do we want to be reading first grade first month of instruction or at the end of the year? And so making things measurable is really, really important. Um, it's important for families to make sure that they know what they disagree with. So they'll often come to us and say, nothing's working, this IEP is awful, my child's not benefiting, special ed doesn't work. And a lot of what we're doing with them is really helping them go through and figure out, okay, do you, do you think the speech and language therapy is working? Well, yeah, that's fine. I like that. That's, he's made a lot of progress there. Okay, so let's make sure we're, we're keeping that. Um, do you think that, that your child needs special education help an hour a day? Well, yeah, I, I do. I just think the teacher isn't qualified. Well, those are two different issues. Let's work on finding a qualified teacher, not on just saying we're not going to participate in the special education program. So helping families sort of go through an issue spot is really important. And teaching families to ask a really simple question. When the district is saying no or refusing to do something that the family thinks is really important, asking them to put it in writing. So we see this all the time, and you will see it too. You'll say to a family, well, when you asked for summer instruction for your child, um, what did they say? And they said, well, they didn't think he was eligible, and then I never heard anything else. And so the follow-up to that is you need to tell them you need that answer in writing because that's what triggers all their rights, and families don't understand that. So they'll feel like, Somebody who seems important told them that they can't have it, they don't have anything in writing that gives them the legal basis for why, they're just in limbo. So we want families to actually ask for a written decision whenever possible. Um, and finally, I want to make sure that you know that families always have the right, and it's probably in the top three most important rights, to challenge a school district's evaluation by asking for a second opinion from someone that they choose. So this is called an independent educational evaluation. I told you at the beginning that evaluation is the foundation for everything that we do in an IEP. And the way that families who have means often do this is that they pay for private evaluations themselves and from top people and they come and challenge the school district. And so when this law was being passed, the advocacy community realized this was going to be a huge barrier for our families who didn't have those kinds of resources. And so this option was written into the law, and it's very powerful. If the family disagrees with the evaluation, no, I don't think my child has an intellectual disability. I think you're missing actually autism. Or no, I don't think that you're right when you say my student doesn't have dyslexia. Absolutely think my child has dyslexia. So when a parent disagrees, and they don't even have to go into the why of it, um, they have the right to request an independent educational evaluation. And the school district only has two options. They can fund it meaning they agree to pay, or the parent chooses their own assessor, or someone the school district will often provide a list of people they know about. The family's not limited to that list. But they can choose to use them. Um, but they can, they can agree to fund it, or they can take them to due process. And here's why that's powerful. In that situation, and it's one of the few situations where this is true, the, the school has the burden of proof. In other words, they have to file they have to show that their evaluation met the legal requirements. They have the burden of proof. And so very often, they will take a look at that evaluation and realize that maybe it wasn't as strong as it could be. Maybe they didn't look at all the things they needed to. And they're, it's not at all unusual for them to agree to fund the independent educational evaluation because they don't want to fund an attorney and a due process hearing to defend an assessment they're not that sure about. So what I tell families is, you know, if the school district really feels like their assessment captured all your students' needs and they're standing behind it, they should file. Um, if they don't want to file and they want to give you the option to get your own assessor in there, 
that's a way for you to get that critical second opinion by someone who's equally qualified or even more qualified than the school district assessors were. And so this is a really, really important right. Again, it's a technical area of the law where you might want to just refer families to their parent training and information centers. But the scenario that you might face is a family who comes in and says, regional center says my son has autism. Kaiser says my son has autism. I asked the school district for an evaluation. They said, we don't see autism, because remember, they're not making a medical diagnosis. They're making an educational evaluation. Um, or we don't, even if he does have autism, we don't think he needs a lot of support. He's passing his classes. He's doing okay. And so the parent's right to challenge that evaluation is critical. So you might want to say, well, you know, you might want to call your parent training center or you might want to contact an education attorney because you actually have a very important right here, which is the right to challenge their evaluations by somebody you choose. And again, because the school then has the burden of proof to show that they did an adequate job and met all the legal requirements, it can be a very, very powerful right for families and that can't be at any expense to them. I mentioned earlier making sure you get things in writing. Uh, how school districts typically do that is they provide prior written notice. So I included the requirements of prior written notice, not because you need to know every bit of this, but if a parent comes into you and says, here's what they said, you can compare it to this document I've provided to see if it actually meets the legal requirements under IDEA for prior written notice. So let's assume that a family's done all these things I'm talking about and still things aren't working. They disagree about placement. They disagree about eligibility. There's a disagreement about uh, whether that student's entitled to a one-on-one -on -one aid so they can stay in general education when the school district's trying to pull, put them into a special day class and pull them out, those sorts of things. I'll just go through very quickly what the landscape looks like in terms of options. The first is basically local resolution, alternative dispute resolution. That means going outside an IEP process, connecting with the people who actually have power in the districts, that's usually your special education administrator for your district, and saying, hey, I want to meet. I haven't been able to resolve this in an IEP. We've had a couple of meetings. We're still at an impasse. I don't really want to file for a due process hearing. I think maybe we could resolve this. So as an example, I recently talked to a family whose child had had a one-on-one -on -one aid and was doing great. So the school district said at the IEP meeting, it's time to, to get rid of the aid. He doesn't need it anymore. He's passing his classes. He's doing well. We're not seeing the behaviors. And the family's point was, well, that's true because the aid is there. So remove the aid and we're going to have a problem. And what this family ended up doing, they were in a basic impasse with the district. The district wanted, absolutely said, we want to remove the aid. We don't see a justification for it. The family said, absolutely not. This is the fundamental linchpin of this child's whole IEP. This is how they stay in the classroom. This is how they learn. This person's essential. Um, and so they ended up going through a local resolution process with a special ed director, and they agreed that they would fade the aid very slowly over time and gather data. And after three months, if the aid was fully faded and the student was still doing just as well and there was hard data and evidence to show that, then they would be okay with fading the aid at that point. So those are the kinds of things and collaborations with the district or the charter that we want families to use, in part because if it doesn't work, they're able to show that they were reasonable, they did try things. If that doesn't work, there's the whole world of formal complaints. So quickly, because I want to leave 15 minutes or so to, for questions if there are questions, um, in the world of formal actions that families can take when there's problems, the first is that there's a discrimination issue. Okay, so all of the students get to go on a field trip. Johnny's not being allowed to go because he needs more support and has behaviors, and so the school is saying he doesn't get to go on the camping trip with his class. Um, or Johnny's not being allowed to participate in uh, an activity at school because they're saying that because of his disability he's not able to benefit from it and everybody else gets to benefit from that, gets to participate in that activity. Um, or we're not going to uh, allow Sally to be in the uh, advanced placement class because she has an IEP and she needs so much support so she's not a good candidate even though all other students are able to take advanced placement courses. Sally's autism creates needs for her, so we just, we're going to just 
carte blanche to say, you know, she's, she's not allowed. So those are issues around discrimination. And in those situations, we're talking about going to the Office of Civil Rights and filing a complaint. It's an easy thing for families to do. It's a form online. There's a six month timeline. I tried to put for you all the timelines so that you can let families know, don't wait too long. It's very sad to have a family say, well, that's so great, I'll file that complaint right now. And you realize it was two years ago that this happened and they're outside the legal time limit. Um, so you file a discrimination complaint with the Office of Civil Rights. And again, this would apply to a student who has a 504 plan or a student who has an IEP um, that basically on the basis of disability, the student is being discriminated against in a program that accepts federal funds. Option two to resolve issues has to do with compliance. Very frequently, what parents are telling us is, we love our IEP. It's got everything we think our child needs in it, but they aren't doing it. I, didn't, I just found out the speech and language therapist has been on maternity leave for three months and my child has not received their speech and language services. So those are simple compliance violations. Or IDEA says you assess within a 60-day timeline and they took 90. So in that kind of situation, state departments of education take complaints. Parents can file them. Again, it's not complex. My IEP says X, Y, and Z. They didn't do it. We want you to investigate it. Um, finally, there is the due process complaint. This is the place where we're basically saying the parents, or, and I should have said at the beginning, when I'm talking about parents, I'm talking about the person who holds education rights. If it's a youth over 18, it's the youth themselves. Um, if it's a foster child, there are important determinations that need to be made about who holds education rights. But uh, if the parent, broadly defined, says, we are at an impasse, we don't agree as to placement, we, don't, we think our child needs speech and language therapy three times a week individually, not in a group once a week. Uh, we think that our child is eligible for an IEP and they're saying our child is not. If it can't be resolved, then the next step in, that, in the due process uh, procedures is to go ahead and file for hearing because that triggers all kinds of rights. Most disputes in special education that get to this point where there's a total disagreement, everybody reaches an impasse, someone files for due process, it can be the district, it's usually the parents, most of these dif difficulties get resolved in mediation. Um, but if they don't get resolved, there's this right to a hearing. And in California, our Office of Administrative Hearings takes care of, uh, of these. And it's a chance for families to make their case and try to get some, some um, momentum. Sometimes, again, they'll, they'll settle uh, through mediation with something that's maybe not everything they wanted. Maybe they wanted a private school placement for their child and maybe they're gonna get reimbursed some small percentage. But this is where the, in, the mediation, the negotiation, and then ultimately the hearing and a hearing officer uh, determination is made. So for families, part of our goal is to keep them from getting to this point. And what we say to them is prepare always as if you're going to a due process hearing so that you don't have to go to a due process hearing. Have your documentation, have your evidence, attend your meetings, Anytime you think that the student's plan isn't working, ask for an IEP meeting. By law, it must be held within 30 days. So the once a year meeting is the minimum requirement. You could meet every single month if you feel like that's what the student needs. Use your rights to avoid getting to the point where you're at a total impasse. But if you really are at the point of total impasse, seek legal help and move forward, um, if, especially if you feel like your child's educational progress is on the line. So I'm going to stop there and see if there's questions. We have about 15 minutes. Um, and then I'll, depending on what, how fast we go through that, I'll also go through a little bit of the resources I provided for you um, so that we can, so that you understand kind of what, what's in this whole package um, to assist you in assisting families. So. Fantastic. Cheryl, boy, that was really thorough and that's very helpful um, here. So we do have a number of questions here. Okay. Um, so the first one is Section 504 versus IDEA is basically um, um, it directs uh, of a right of education versus what is needed to succeed. So the question is, this, is there no special education in college? That's a very good question. So there is no, there are no IEPs in college. Um, once your student graduates from high school with a regular diploma or reaches age 22 if they don't get a diploma, 
and they enroll in any kind of post-secondary education program, including our community colleges or four-year colleges and universities, there's no IEP. There's no legal obligation for those post-secondary settings to individualize or specialize the education. You know, with an IEP, we can say the student only has to answer one out of every three questions on the final exam just to demonstrate mastery. There's no such requirement in college. So we tell parents a lot of our transition work, and by the way, one of the resources I included was our trainings that we do on special topics. So we have one on just transition. Um, and we also work with a collaboration to do a going to college with a disability workshop, I mean, a conference every year, is to help parents understand that. That, you know, you want to work on autonomy and independence and self-determination for your student who wants to go to college because they need to learn how to advocate for themselves. What they can have in college are accommodations. 504 applies in the college setting. So it's typical to say the student needs a note taker. The student needs a quiet place to take tests. The student needs extended time. So these are not things that change the content of what's being uh, required that a student learn but that they are able to show that they have mastered this in alternative ways. Great. The next one, and I know this is really common here, is how can a regional center IPP help cover the gaps in Section 504 to better support those people? Uh, what would the IPP need to say? So really, how does the IPP integrate with um, 504 and IDEA? So it's a, it's a big problem in our experience because regional center often, and I, and I should say just in case anybody outside of California is listening, regional centers are unique to California, but the students who, who are eligible for developmental uh, services, um, the school districts often take a hands-off approach once a student's in school. And they feel like it's the school's job to do the education piece and then once the student's graduating or getting close to graduating, we'll kind of get, get involved again. It's actually really important that the IPP and the IEP be integrated in some way. It's not at all unusual for us to see two totally different plans. So, you know, the IPP will have goals for the student around learning transportation, take public transportation, or how to access medical care, or any of the sort of non-academic areas. Um, but actually, many of those could also be integrated into an IEP or a 504 plan in terms of you know, trans, uh, transition support um, for the student. So the first thing we do is, because interagency collaboration is generally one of the biggest things that, that families struggle with, is make sure that when it's time to have a 504 meeting, just to answer this is a 504 specific question it sounds like, that you say, I want to make sure that my regional center case manager is able to attend. So here's three or four dates where we can meet rather than letting the school district determine when everybody's going to meet. And then often you find the regional center case manager isn't there. Um, and then I think some discussion in the meeting when, you know, the school saying, well, we don't think that's an educationally necessary service, so we're not going to provide it, then can happen with the regional center case manager there to say, well, but if that's having an impact on the student's uh, home life or community life, that's something we could look at providing in the case plan. There are mechanisms in the law to determine who has interagency responsibility. So it is possible to ask for a hearing because the whole issue is who's responsible for doing what. Um, attorneys should know that that's an option. Um, at regional center, we find case managers are often very, very busy and if the school district seems to be mostly in charge of things. They'll often take that back seat. You have to climb the ladder up above your case manager to the supervisor sometimes to say, you know, we're going to need support. It's also very, very important to think about when we, when we talk about how to support students to remember that education is a very broad term. So when we talk, when I talked about 504 and IDEA, I said, you know, if this is impacting them educationally. So education isn't just your academics, your reading and your writing and your math. Education can be your behavior. We certainly see situations where a student ends up in a group home because their behaviors are so, and their needs are so significant because of their autism that the family themselves no longer feels that they can support that child at home. 
Whereas if we could have gotten more support into the plan for them at school, maybe we wouldn't have gotten to that place. So that's a really unfortunate thing to see happen. So that's the other thing is to say, look, the goal that we're working on here has both a family and community component, i.e. it's in regional center territory, but it also has an educational component. It relates to social skills. It relates to behavior. It relates to the student's difficulty with self-advocacy or with um, access to uh, understanding how to work in their groups and their in their programs and so on. And so to really think about making the case that there's an overlap and then bringing both agencies to the table. It's not an easy thing to do. If you reach an impasse, I suggest that you call us. Um, and sometimes the client's rights advocate at Regional Center can be very helpful. Again, that's a California specific thing um, because they are attorneys through Disability Rights California who are located inside the agency themselves and can help you navigate where to go next in that situation. Excellent. And here's another question. I hope I don't butcher this. This is an LRE question okay. uh, here. So a uh, school district states that since student not in resource in all gen general education classes, not eligible for continued uh, 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 special education, how can you combat that? Right, so remember I said that to be eligible for an IEP, you have to meet a two-prong test. You have to have a disability that fits into one of 13 categories, which it sounds like this student does, and the student needs specialized instruction in some form. Now, that instruction may be support pushed into the classroom. So if there's still aid support that's benefiting them, um, if they are getting some, re some special education consultation to the teacher, so maybe not direct services, but some consultation is still necessary. Um, it's, this is a, a very common thing for students with developmental disabilities where the teacher just needs to know how to modify or accommodate how the lesson planning is done or how the activities are done for the student. But once that's done, the student's very capable of, of meeting expectations. Then that's still an eligible student because even with the consultation model, the student is still needing that second prong of specialized academic instruction. It's not direct service, but it's consultation. So what I would say in that situation is have the family ask for that. Um, and again, maybe with a fade plan over time. But if they really aren't getting or needing specialized instruction in any way, shape, or form, they may have become a 504 eligible student, meaning they still have the disability, still can have an educational impact on the student in various ways, but they don't need their program individualized to their unique needs and specialized education provided. So you, you could reach an impasse. You can try to resolve it by calling an IEP meeting and showing that, in fact, there is still consultation need, needed. I, I will say that one of the things families can do that's very effective is do a better job of documenting what they're seeing with things like homework. So families will say, well, yeah, you say he's doing really well because I sit with him from 8 until 11 every night and we do the homework together and I'm scaffolding every step of the way. And I will say, well, unless you've documented that for the team, videotape it. Keep a log of when you started and when you stopped and how many breaks your student needed and how often they have a meltdown during homework time. Because if the expectation is that in order to access Gen Ed, they do that homework independently and they're not, that may be creating the case for why more specialized academic instruction is indeed needed. Okay, and we have a couple more um, here. So it says many programs are closing, consolidating, moving many students away from their home schools. Is there a way to challenge this trend? Oh boy, that's a very, a very good question. Oakland Unified here in the Bay Area right now is in the middle of trying to close, I think, 24 schools or something. Um, so there's, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is that charter schools enrollment is up, and so public school, regular public school enrollment is down, and so resources are gone. Um, you cannot say you have to keep a school open or a program open for my child, right? The IEP, remember I said it needs to be kind of camera ready if you move from uh, Berkeley to New York City tomorrow that they would know how to provide it. Well, the same is true even within the district. So if the district says your child was in a full inclusion program at Manzanita School in Oakland, um, but we're closing Manzanita or closing that special day class at Manzanita or that, that inclusion program at Manzanita, but we have the same exact comparable program at this other school, it's very hard for a parent 
to, to fight that. They don't, you don't have any ammunition to force them to keep that program open. What you can do is immediately call an IEP where you carefully document all the support of what's been working in that program because you're saying you have to provide a comparable program. You can't just plop them in a brand new program that doesn't have all these different pieces that were already in there. And that's why during the presentation earlier I said it's really important to memorialize exactly what they're doing when they say don't worry about it, the teacher knows and they'll, they're will they accommodating all kinds of ways and don't worry your pretty little head about it, we, we can figure it out. You do need to worry about it because in this situation you need to spell out, you know, part of what works is that the OT comes into the class and does stuff together with everybody and this is a student who doesn't want to be pulled out for OT so they benefit from that program. If that's not documented, how do you fight for it? So you, you are limited in your ability to push back against those kinds of closures and changes in programming, but you absolutely have a right to fight for a comparable program that's only going to be in a, a useful right if your IEP truly documents everything that they're doing. Okay, and Cheryl, I, you know, I've been doing disability work my entire life. I will never get all the acronyms down, so maybe you can help me with this. Okay. Uh, this is a follow-up from the college response. What if they are over 26-year-old? Uh, would uh, PTI waive the age limit, or uh, where should those uh, individuals go? Now, what is a PTI? <laughs> Okay, so yes, and, and I want to apologize because I should have defined this right at the beginning and I ended up doing it kind of in the middle. A parent training and information center is something that is a program funded by the U.S. Department of Education, available at least one in every state and territory, where families and community members, so any of you can call a PTI and ask questions, um, can get technical support, information, and resources. So. We don't provide legal support. We're not going to take on a one-on-one -on -one case through, the, through a PTI. Um, but what we are doing is helping parents really understand what their rights are, how they can participate effectively, what their problem-solving options are. We're not going to give them advice, legal advice, about what they should or shouldn't do, but we do want to lay out for them all the options. This question that's being asked, thank you for asking it because it's a really important one. One of the things that I've learned for a lot of our students, especially those with developmental disabilities or mental health disabilities, is that often college ends up working better in the late 20s or even early 30s because people are just maturing on a different timetable or they're getting other things handled in their lives before they're ready to go to college. So the PTIs only are federally funded through the U.S. Department of Ed through for students up to age 26. That doesn't mean you can't call us for referrals. And a lot of times what we'll do in that situation is refer you to the Disabled Students Program at the local college um, or training program. Uh, the Disabled Students Programs are responsible for making sure that all these appropriate laws are being followed and so on. And there's also a, or other organizations such as AHEAD, um, and, and various national and local agencies that are supporting in, the Centers for Independent Living, that are supporting people with disabilities and can help in terms of, of your rights in that situation. So if you don't know what else to do, call us because any of the Parent Training and Information Center should at least be able to give you a good referral for somebody, for a student who's over age 26. Fantastic. Um, I'm sure there'll be more questions later, but you have covered a lot of great information um, here at a level that even an attorney can understand. So, um, you know, a couple things. Why don't we just spend a little bit of time uh, ending this about talking a little bit about uh, DREDF, some of the work you do and some of the um, uh, other services uh, DREDF has uh, uh, provides. And I know for me personally, um, it certainly set me on a path uh, here. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for dread of, which I think it's a good thing I'm here, but we'll see. Definitely a good thing. Okay. All right. Well, let me tell you, um, it's an honor to be associated with dread if I've been there now for more than a dozen years. Um, first of all, we're unique because everyone who works at DREDF either has a disability or a child with a disability, and so there's this unique collaboration. Those two groups can sometimes be at odds. Um, and it's just a wonderful environment to work in in that respect. And a lot of our work at DREDF involves high impact litigation. So 
we were very involved in, um, as you said at the beginning in the introduction, uh, the passage of some of these important laws, such as the IDEA, the Special Education Law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, fundamentally involved in, in getting that legislation passed. Um, we do policy work, uh, everything from health policy. People don't even realize simple things like a woman who goes to get a mammogram who's a wheelchair user and the machine doesn't come down to her level, so she's not entitled to those kinds of basic health care services. Um, all the way to a um, uh, case a few years ago involved uh, arguing around captioning for videos with Netflix and and the uh, the argument that the internet was not a place as defined under the ADA and therefore not required to follow the requirements of the ADA. and uh, that big legal battle uh, we ended up prevailing in, and it was really, it was a, with the um, uh, American uh, Deaf community, I'm sorry, I'm having a momentary lapse about the right acronym, um, but on behalf of our, our clients there. And so as a result of that legislation, I'm sorry, as a result of that settlement, um, the internet is now considered a place under the ADA. It does not have to be brick and mortar, and that's had repercussions for all these online education programs and so on. Um, we also do just a lot of civil rights work. We're very involved in uh, educational equity, the dismantling the school to prison pipeline for students with disabilities. Often people don't understand that students with disabilities and students of color and the intersection of those two things is one of the highest risk population in terms of um, you know, ending up in jail or prison long term and trying to turn that around. So at every place that we where we find a vulnerability in terms of options for adequate, appropriate civil rights for all members of society, including those with disabilities, you'll find right, of, right there at the forefront, and we are really proud to be doing that work. Great. And then I know in closing, um, and we just might talk about um, you know, supporting Dredf because Dredf really has some incredible resources um, here, including Cheryl, of course. Um, I know for those that are watching, there's a, a, an evaluation we're asking. Uh, of course, you need to fill out our paperwork uh, here, but also there's a, an evaluation, as I understand it, specifically to Dredf, and this is important for a number of reasons um, um, here, which in Includes as I understand that you know part of this is you need to document the number of um, people that have watched this. Right. So let me say first, everything we do is free to our to people that we serve. So in the Parent Training and Information Center, we talk to hundreds and hundreds of families, um, and everything we do is based on donations and grants. Um, and we're always so appreciative of donations because every single penny gets puts to very good use at Dredd. Um, so part of our requirements to get the grant funding that we do through the U.S. Department of Education is that we document who we're serving. So please, please take a minute and do your online evaluation. Um, even if you do it after the fact, it's really valuable to us. We appreciate the feedback. We read them carefully. Um, doing the whole webinar thing is relatively new for us too, so it's really helpful to get your feedback and also just helps us make the training better and document that we're actually doing what we're being funded to do. I also neglected to mention the third code, and I want to make sure I do that here for those of you who are trying to get continuing education credits, which is 9930. So I want you to be able to get the credits you need, but yes, thank you for, for saying that. We absolutely would appreciate you filling out your evaluations. Um, there is a link here. Um, uh, it's a Survey Mon Monkey link, link. I can't talk anymore. Link for you to fill it out, and we'd really appreciate it if you take a minute and do that for us. So please do that whether you're watching live today or you're watching later on YouTube. This will be um, up, and also because we did go over an hour and a half, we will be able to grant one and a half hours today. Um, um, Cheryl, I want to thank you and the entire Dread of the folks for everything you do for the disability um, community. And I know just personally the hard work that you folks do on very little money and the systemic changes that you're responsible for. For those of you that are watching or are interested in future programs, if you email amy, A-M-Y, at gspt.org, 
We will make sure that you uh, are on our mailing list for future programs um, here. And with that, I want to thank you so much, Cheryl, and we are closing out. Great. Thanks so much. Okay.